How's everybody doing tonight? Good, nice, okay. Like a fourth of you are awake, sweet. Well, for the, for the four of you out there that said nice, I'm glad that you're here. So everybody else that was asleep and is now awake, how's the night? <laughs> Good, okay, there we go. Wow, you, you guys almost failed the second time. <laughs> Um, my name is Greg Miller. I am one of the seventh grade boys small group leaders, which we got some here and we got some back there. Yeah, there we go. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> um, I have been doing ministry here for about five years as a leader, but I've been uh, a part of this ministry for a little bit longer than that and we'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, tonight we are going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. We're going to be continuing our series called The Advocate, which uh, Sam and Sam did a great job uh, <laughs> talking about so far in their previous messages. Uh, um, and we'll get to talk about that a little bit as well. They did a great job teeing me up um, to be able to talk here. But before we get into all that, I wanted to share a little bit about myself, a little bit of a story of um, me growing up and my life and how I came to know Jesus. Um, so yeah, yeah, uh, I was born in Colorado, but I moved to Pennsylvania whenever I was about three years old. It's funny, my dad and I were just talking the other day. He asked me, um, he asked me like, do you have any memories from whenever we lived in Colorado? And I actually had about four to five memories um, from whenever I was three or younger, um, which was kind of cool. They were mainly like playing with stamps with like our neighbor, um, which was kind of neat. And then I remember sitting in my dad's truck um, and he was like buckling me in. And I don't know if three-year-olds normally chew gum, but like he gave me gum and he just told me don't swallow it. And as soon as he left to like get in the driver's seat, I swallowed it. So obviously um, I didn't listen very well. And um, yeah, and that's an odd like first memory to have. But yeah, nonetheless, um, yeah, a little, little tangent there. But I, again, moved to Pennsylvania whenever I was about three years old, and I grew up in a little town called Freeport, which some of you, I'm sure, are from. Where, where are my Freeport people at? Anybody? Okay, we have a hand raiser, which tells you what Freeport's like, which is super dope, um, in the back there, yep. <laughs> so I grew up in Freeport. I went to Freeport School District for my entire time in public school, and I loved it. For those of you who go there, um, definitely take Miss Lund's class. Like, her film classes are the absolute best. Honestly, if you don't go to Freeport, you should try to convince your parents to move to the Freeport School District so that you can take her classes. That's how good they are. Um, they're the best thing that I have experienced in education. So, that's where I went to school. Um, I grew up with two sisters, Sophia, who did an awesome job on the worship team. Um, she is, yeah, yeah, you guys can clap for Sophia. Yeah, yeah, she kills it. She kills it up here. Um, burp, burp, burp. Yeah, and then uh, Maddie, who is um, our middle sibling, she and I share an apartment together, and she's also going to school um, for the same thing that I went for, photography. So um, her and I, or the, the three of us, we all grew up, and, um, and we kind of did a lot of stuff together. And one of those things was going to church. Now, I went to church uh, since I was really little, basically for as long as I can remember. And whenever I was eight, year old, eight, eight years old, I decided to be baptized. And it was a decision that I made um, after like thinking about it, and it was one that I felt comfortable making at that point in my faith. And so I got baptized when I was eight years old. However, I didn't really start getting serious about my faith until I was in high school, roughly. Um, and whenever I was in high school, I helped lead Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I was involved in a couple of the different, like, I guess, Bible programs um, at, the, at the school that I went to. I also went here to New Life Students. At the time, it's called Relevant Student Ministries, which tells you how long ago I was here. Like, I think pretty much Corey and the other leaders know about it, and everyone else here just knows about New Life Students. Um, but nonetheless, I grew up doing all of, like, the like the Christian stuff. And I honestly, I loved it. I really, really enjoyed it. I had a great deal of head knowledge and concepts about the Bible and stories from the Old Testament, things that Jesus taught. Like I had a good conceptual idea about who Jesus was, which is one of the reasons why I decided to follow God. My, my relationship with God was much more of an intellectual decision. And it was one that like, it just made sense to me to follow God. 
However, what I was lacking was that relational connection. It, it had its times. There were times that I felt relational with God, that I would really go to him as, as a friend or as a father. But largely, I followed him out of a sense of, like I said, intellectual knowledge. It just made sense to me. I wanted to follow God, and I was just okay with being, with being that way. However, what God wants for us is something much deeper, something much more intimate and personal, and he was calling me into that. And I just had not taken those steps at the time. Um, The reason why he wants us to be in a personal and intimate relationship with us is because he wants his Holy Spirit to be able to live within us. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and when we follow him, the Holy Spirit resides within us. And we talked about that a little bit in the previous weeks in this series, but I'm going to expound on that more tonight. Um, Whenever the Holy Spirit lives in us, He produces the fruit of the Spirit, which we're going to talk about. And I know that was like a lot of church lingo, um, which I'm going to talk about more, and I'm going to explain everything that I mean by that. But before we do that, I would like us all to pray and invite the Holy Spirit tonight. Heavenly Father, I pray that you are with us right now. I pray that you are with everyone who's in this room, anybody who's watching this over a recording, Lord, I pray that you be with each and every one of us, God. I pray that you would calm any nerves. I pray that you would remove me and replace my words with the words of your Son and the words of your Spirit, Lord. I pray that you would move in the hearts and the lives of the people here. And it's in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, we're kind of going to get into the meat and potatoes here. This is probably one of the most important things that I will say in this message. And it is this, there will come a time in your faith or your questioning when you will be forced to make your faith your own. Following Jesus and believing in God is something that is really personal. And for you, maybe up until this point, it's been a tradition. Like I said, for me, I grew up in a household that was predominantly Christian. Like my mom and my dad both took me to church we would uh, we'd go to Sunday school, my sisters and I, like I talked about, it was tradition for us. Our grandparents, all the way down the line, most of us were believers. And so for me, it was just what I knew. It just made sense to go because it was kind of like a habit. Um, and for some of you, it might be the same. Or for some of you, maybe you're going to youth group here every week because your friends are here, you love hanging out, it's become part of your routine, and I think that is awesome. Like, I don't want to discount that. That is super cool, and I want you to keep doing that because it's great. For me, it was just like it was just like a habit, and it was honestly really cool. I like to hang out with my friends. I like to hear about Jesus. But you have to reach a point where you're willing to go deeper than that. You have to reach a point where you make your faith your own, and this is what I, I mean by that. Um, you know, you have to decide for yourself uh, that you believe in God, that you believe in him and you want to follow him with your life. Or if you don't make that decision, the opposite of that is that you live the way that the world lives and God really isn't present in your life because you're not, you're not following him. You're not allowing him to, to change you and and change the way that you live. So again, there will come a time when you have to make an intentional decision about what you believe and how you're going to live your life. You'll find that you have the freedom to choose whatever you want to do. You'll have the freedom to dedicate yourself to either following Christ or to following your own ways and just kind of doing whatever you, uh, whatever you please. But let me tell you that, and you'll hear from my personal story, that, uh, that choosing to follow Christ will be so much more rewarding than choosing to just do whatever you want, which typically leads to a lot of hurt. Okay, so I promise that, uh, that this will all connect back to the Holy Spirit producing fruit in our lives. But firstly, I want to give an example from my own life about what it looks like to not really have that personal and intimate connection, because I haven't always. Um, I graduated from high school in 2018, which is five years ago now, which is kind of crazy. Um, so I graduated in 2018, and over the course of those five years, a lot has happened. Um, it, you know, in the fall of 2018, Um, there started to be some, like, difficulties in my family. There was a lot of family strife and kind of arguments and tension. It was very stressful for me, and it really, like, affected my mental health. And um, for those of you who are in here and want to know a little bit more about that, I'd be free to to tell you a little bit more about my story in detail. But for sake of time, um, I just want you to know that between 2018 and the fall of 2018 and the fall of 2021, were the most difficult years of my life. 
and I'll share a little bit about that. Okay, so like I said, I was involved in a lot of arguments and tension and disagreements, and there was a lot of hurt with the people that were very close to me. And for some of you, I, I can imagine that you can relate with that. There is probably times where you just feel sort of powerless to the situations in your life, whether that be at home or at school or with your friends, and it just seems like you can't ever like get out of that wade pool. That, like You're always just kind of taking a breath of air, and you're just trying to make it past um, each and every day. And for me, that's largely what my time was like throughout those couple years. And of course, it wasn't all doom and gloom, but it was, it was pretty difficult for me. Um, whenever I say that, uh, that it was difficult, um, there's a couple things that immediately come to mind. Firstly, uh, why would God allow me to, to go through all of the crap that I'm going, going to talk about and kind of in, uh, get into more detail with? Why would he allow me to go through all of that if I had believed in him for so long and I had gone to church and gone to Sunday school and youth group and I led different organizations? Why would he allow me to go through all of that if like, I was just so you know, active in doing the, the Christian stuff? You see, that kind of relationship is transactional. It, it says, if I go to youth group or if I go to church or if I listen to Christian music or if I, you know, if I show up at, uh, at a Bible study, then God, in turn, owes me a, an easier life. He owes me a more convenient life without trial or tribulation or without hardship. He owes me, um, you know, my parents getting along. He owes me my friends um, being kind to me. And, like, that's a very transactional way of looking at faith. And that's not how it works. God calls us out of a transactional relationship into something much, much deeper. And so I want to encourage you, if that's the way that you think, then listen in because there's something much greater in store that I want to share with you. So during that time, when I say it was difficult, what I mean by that is I had a 15-minute drive from my house in Freeport to where I went to school in Cranberry for college. And during those, during those years where, where there was all that tension and stress, I had that 15-minute drive where I essentially was trying to navigate through the streets and through the roads that it took to get there, while looking through tears. Like the entire time, very often, I was just crying because of all of the stress and pressure that was put on, on my daily life because of the re relational situations that I was in. I was just trying to navigate through the road, which was just blurry. I mean, it was like, it was like if you ever have goggles on and you look underwater and like they fill up, it's what it was kind of like, except I was driving, going like 55 miles an hour, which is not safe. Um, so I was just like trying to navigate while, um, while also trying to get my anger to subside so that whenever I went into class, I could actually focus on what I was trying to learn and what I was paying for. And it, it was really difficult. When I say that they were the most difficult years of my life, it means that I was fighting tooth and nail to overcome a pornography addiction that had started whenever I was in high school and it was just flaring up because of all the other things in my life. I was fighting tooth and nail to try to get this stuff out, but I was doing it in my own power. So I was largely unsuccessful. When I say that it was hard for me, what I mean is that I wanted nothing more to make sure that my sisters had a place where they felt that they could confide in me because they too were experiencing a lot of the same things that I was. We're siblings, we live in the same house, we have the same parents, and it was equally, if not more, difficult for them. And sometimes I just made it worse because I had all the stress built up and I would lash out on them over like stupid, simple things. If you have siblings, don't do that because sometimes they just want to know that you're there and they don't want somebody else yelling at them. So like sometimes I would do the exact opposite of what I was hoping to do. And the reason why things were so bleak in my life during this time is because I had a lack of the Holy Spirit living within me. I had not allowed him to take residence inside of me and to produce the fruit that we're going to talk about. Now, like I said, Sam and Sam have done a great job so far in this series discussing who the Holy Spirit is and the importance of uh, being continually filled by him. They did a fantastic job. 
Now, during those years from 2018 to 2021, whenever I had to make my faith my own, I had very little idea of who the Holy Spirit actually was. Like I said, it was more of a, head, like a, a, a mental exercise for me. Like I was trying to fit him in the box so that I could understand him instead of allowing him to change my way of thinking. I wanted him to fit in what I was familiar with instead of, him, uh, uh, instead of allowing him to change and transform <clears throat> my mind. So... Um, As we discussed in this series, when the Holy Spirit is filling us up, he is providing supernatural overflow of what we call the fruit of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We may have read these scriptures, um, but just to refresh, I would like to read them again. As we see in 1 Corinthians, this is chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says this, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. We also see in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verses 19 and 20, it says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. So both in 1 Corinthians, obviously really sending home the message that God wants the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. We are that temple. And there's a lot of imagery with you know, the temples and, and how they worked in, um, in Jewish culture and like the, the richness that's there. But just think of it as his home. The Holy Spirit's home is within each and every one of us. It's not, uh, it's not just a, a single person. He doesn't move from place to place. Like, hey, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go crash at Tunch's place tonight. I'll, I'll see you in a little bit, Greg. Like, I'm gonna go hang out with Tunch. Like, He's in all of us who call Jesus our Lord and Savior. Now, since the Holy Spirit lives inside of God's followers, we are able to be filled with him, which, as I said, produces an overflow of the fruit of the Spirit. Well, what are those fruits? Well, in Galatians 5, which is my favorite chapter in the Bible right now, um, it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And just a little, um, just a pause here. Forbearance, if you look up the definition of that, it's essentially um, patient, uh, I believe it's patient endurance, something to that extent. So there's like, there's like double patience in here, um, which is fun fact. Um, anyways, picking back up. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited provoking and envying one another. That's Galatians 5, verses 22 through 26, which takes us right into our take-home point for today, which is when we submit to the Holy Spirit, he produces fruit in our lives. When we submit to the Holy Spirit, he produces fruit in our lives. Now, that word submit is really important because it reminds us that it is an active decision. It's not something that just happens passively. It's something that we have to actively decide. If we want Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, that's a decision that we have to make. And we get the benefit of having the Holy Spirit fill us up. So, reading over the, uh, the fruit again, it is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I believe that anyone, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, can look at those things and see that they are good things. Like it says, there is no law against them. Whether or not you believe in God, you can look at those that, that list of fruit uh, and see that it's a good, they're good qualities, they're good traits to have. Well, of course so, because God designed them and he designed them to be the overflow of when we have the Holy Spirit. So during my time in college, when I went through all of that hardship, practically none of these things were active in my life because I didn't allow the Holy Spirit to live inside me and to fill me up and to uh, produce that fruit. The good news is, though, that God never gives up on any of us. He didn't give up on me. He's not going to give up on you. He's not going to give up on you, none of us. He will not stop pursuing us until, uh, until well, we make that decision. Um, you know, if we make that decision that we want to follow God, then he's going to continue to pursue us. Honestly, I need to correct myself there. There is no end to that pursuit. Um, I guess once you die, maybe there's an end to it there. Um, but while we're still living and breathing, God will not stop pursuing us. So it's never too late to decide that you want to accept the new life that he offers. So the next logical question um, is what 
happen to me? Where, where did my story go? If I talked about all these things that did happen, and at that time I didn't have the Holy Spirit, well then, where am I now? Well, I can say that uh, there was a shift that happened, and it was actually fairly recent. I'm 23 years old, and it did not happen until July of this year, whenever I went to Uganda. For those of my Ugandan friends who are watching, I wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I love you guys, and uh, Millie told me to send you the link, so hopefully you get to see this. Um, but nonetheless, while I was in Uganda, I went from Jesus being just my savior like I said, that intellectual knowledge. I, I knew what it meant for him to be my savior. I made that decision and I was comfortable with that. However, I did not know what it meant for Jesus to be my Lord, truly. And in Uganda, there was a moment whenever I was on my knees and I was weeping and I just let it go. And I just said, Jesus, the only thing that matters is you. And from that moment forward, there has been a significant and noticeable change within my life. One that even I can see, which typically it's hard to evaluate yourself. And even I could see that there was a change within me. And what I can confidently say is that having these, uh, these fruits will drastically change the way that you live your life. However, the antithesis to that is that it's an impossibility to have these things without the Holy Spirit. So, are all of you still awake? Give me a yeah if you are. Okay, awesome. I just wanted to pick back up because we're coming on the home stretch, but some of these things are really important that I've left to share. So again, it's an impossibility to have those fruits without him. There's actually, if you read in Galatians, um, a couple of verses before what we read, there are like, I forget what they're actually called, but I'm just going to call them like the anti-fruits of the Spirit, like the things that you have in your life or that you experience if you don't have the Holy Spirit. And they're pretty nasty. Um, I, I would encourage you guys, it might be a good talking point in small group, to read over those things. Um, but it's impossible for you to have the fruits without the Holy Spirit in your life. You might experience them for a brief moment. You might experience joy. You might experience self-control, maybe for a little bit, but they won't be lasting. Whenever I say overflow, I mean overflow. I mean in those moments when you feel like there is nothing left, that you can't pull from anywhere within inside of you, to, to keep going, the Holy Spirit is there within you to produce those fruits. And whenever you don't have him, there's no well to draw the water from. There's no root system to keep those things going. I mean, how many times have you guys tried doing something as hard as you can and you just could not achieve it? Maybe you were trying to break a habit or maybe you were trying to, you know, love that person who was really, uh, that was really mean to you and you just like couldn't get past it. You just like had all this anger built up. That's because when we try to draw from within ourselves, we don't get very far at all. So whenever I allowed the Holy Spirit to begin working in my life, what I noticed is that these fruits started to become present. I can confidently say that this year, I have had more time away from my pornography addiction or, uh, or habit than I have ever had in, in like my entire, um, I guess, five years that I've, I've been struggling with it. And I know that that terminology, that, you know, talking about that topic can be, can be hard, but the, the fact of the matter is sin is disgusting no matter what kind of sin it is, whether it's uh, pornography, whether it's lying, whether it's stealing or cheating, whether it's being dishonest or disloyal, being a coward. Sin rears its nasty head no matter what form it takes. And so while it's uncomfortable to talk about, the reason why it's uncomfortable is because we were not made for it. We were not made to have sin in our life. So a little, little side tangent there. Um, but all that to say, um, I started to see that the Holy Spirit was, was working within me, not just in that area of my life, but in other areas as well. Slowly but surely, I was, I was willing to surrender things that I once had a, a much tighter grasp on, a much, like, at very closed fists. Like, this is mine. I can take care of this. I screwed this up, so I want to, you know, I want to manage this. And God is like, no, like, you got to let go and the Holy Spirit is going to do the work within you. So I began to flourish, and it was, it was really, really cool. So what is even more exciting is that, like I said earlier, it's not just offered to me or to any just one individual. It's offered to all of us. There isn't like a faith lottery that like, okay, you know, I'm going to pull a number, and I hope that it gets called. I hope that God calls my number. Like, I, I bought the Powerball. Like, I'm a hit big with God. Like, no, it's... It's every single one of us that decides to call Jesus um, our Lord and Savior. And that Lord part is very important as well. 
So as we read in 1 Corinthians, we are the temple in the home of the Holy Spirit, and we have direct access to the things that he offers us. Um, You know, when you make that intentional decision uh, in seeking God and uh, taking that from like an intellectual exercise to actually allowing him to work in your heart, then we begin to see um, the wisdom and the understanding that he offers us. So um, I know that this decision is not one that is just to be made lightly. I mean, I'm 23 years old, um, which isn't as old as uh, Pastor Mark, but... um, but, but it, it is a little bit, I hope he watches this, um, but it is a little bit older than you guys. Um, but like I said, five years ago, I was still in high school. And so those five years, they changed a lot. And there was a lot of intentionality that uh, was required to, to get to where I am now. And even now, I still have no idea what the heck I'm doing because I'm fully trying to fully rely on God. Like, I'll I'll try to take a little bit back, and he's like, nope, you got to let go. And so what I want to encourage you is that right now, as you're questioning things, like that is a good place to be. It is a a good place to be asking for support from a mentor and asking for support from, um, from people that you trust, people who are older than you, or even your peers. Like if there's somebody that you look up to, um, you know, it's good to have those discussions together. And just talk about it. Like, just talk and ask questions. Do not be afraid to be wrong or to admit that you're wrong or to have somebody tell you that there's something um, that's new to you. Like, it's okay. That is a good good place to be. For me, I think what took so long for me to get to the point where I was willing to do that is I had the pride of, like, I want to do it myself. I want to be able to take the credit of, like, you know, I did the deep deep dives and I did all the, the research and I figured it out. And that was just foolish. So seek counsel, take advantage of the small group leaders that you guys have here, pick their brains, you know, try to try to get as much as you can out of your time with them, whether it's here or you guys get to talk throughout the week, really use them as a valuable resource because they're here to help you with those things. So while we don't know the answers, hopefully we can help direct you based on the way that God has worked on each of us. All right, so we're going to go to small group here, but as a next step, I wanted to read this. This is something that we can do together. It says this, I will talk to God about allowing the Holy Spirit to live in me. Now notice that I didn't just say, I will allow the Holy Spirit to live within me. Because while it is a very important decision for you to make, it's something that you should should get uh, an understanding of first. I want you to talk to God and really ask him like, okay, can you tell me a little bit more about the Holy Spirit? What does it mean? What will my my life look like after I accept him? or accept your son and allow the Holy Spirit to fill me? Like, is there something that I'm doing wrong? Like, it's good to ask those questions and converse with God. So that's why the next step says, I will talk to God about allowing the Holy Spirit to live within me. I think it's important to note that accepting Jesus uh, as your Lord and Savior is a necessary step to take prior to the Holy Spirit filling you up. It's important to know that, like, the Holy Spirit fills those who call Jesus uh, their Lord and Savior, who are his followers. And so what that looks like for us, uh, we talk about it each week. I think we have a slide at some point here. Um, we talk about the ABCs. And it's a, it's a good little tool um, to be able to keep in the back of your mind to share with others or to use yourself. And it says, you know, A is admit, admitting that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior. B is believing, believing in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So admitting that you need someone to save you, that you need someone to be a Lord over your life. And then the second one is believing that Jesus is that person and believing that it's that person, he is that person for you. God, God is um, the only way to receive that. Uh, C is confessing, confessing that Jesus is your Lord and and Savior, that public declaration of your faith, and committing to follow him in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's just just like a little outline to help make it a little bit easier for you to remember. Um, But taking those steps, those general steps, are a necessary thing to do prior to receiving the Holy Spirit. And so if these things are really attractive to you, you want to be able to live this way, you want to be able to have um, the fruits of the Spirit in your life, then this is something that that you'll have to consider first if you haven't already done it. If you have, that's awesome. 
then you can, you know, you can really dive in and dig deep into what the Holy Spirit looks like in your life. Um, but if you're not quite there yet, that is perfectly okay. Ask questions about this first. Start where you are and go from there. I don't want you to be overwhelmed. Um, I guess before we really uh, finish up and say the next step together, um, I wanted to say that I was talking to Millie, um, who is one of my dear friends from, from Uganda. She had the opportunity to travel here um, over the, the course of the last week, and we got to spend some time. And right before coming here, I was talking with her and saying goodbye, and she asked, um, she asked about my message, because I had said I was going to be speaking tonight. Told her I was talking about the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit. She said, well, did you know that the, the fruits of the Spirit is actually one fruit? Because it says, it says here, um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patient, uh, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. She said, she said that it's a single fruit that has multiple parts to it. Think of like, a, like an orange. Like whenever you, it's one orange, but you take it apart, and then it has like each little section that you can share with your friends. Um, think of it like that. Think of it as one fruit with multiple parts. And so what she said is that whenever you receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is living within you, it's not just a couple of these things that, that get added to your life. It's all of them. It's all of the, the things that are listed there because it's one fruit. And the Holy Spirit produces that within you. She said sometimes there, some of those attributes can be blocked by things in our past. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe if there's a lot of hurt that's per, uh, preventing us from really letting go and accepting that fruit. But nonetheless, it's all within us. Whenever the Holy Spirit is within us, it is impossible for any one of these things to not be present. And so I thought that was a cool way to look at it because I had always thought like, oh, you know, maybe I'll get some joy. Uh, maybe peace is for me, but like faithfulness and gentleness, maybe not. Maybe I'll just, you know, I'll just take what I can get. No, you get all of it. So um, yeah, little, little advice from Millie. She's, she's awesome. Okay, if we can throw up that next step, uh, we'll, we'll take this together. Uh, if it's a place that you're at and you want to do. It says this, I will talk to God about allowing the Holy Spirit to live in me. All right, uh, let's pray, and then we'll head to small group. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every person that's in here, Lord, no matter the age, no matter the place that they are in their life. We thank you for the fact that you never stop pursuing us, that you never, that you never end with your pursuit of trying to um, to turn us back to your son or to deepen our relationship with you, Lord. We thank you that you grant us wisdom anytime that we ask for it, Lord. We thank you that your Holy Spirit lives within us. What a gift that is, God. We thank you for the fruit. We thank you for the, the life change that you offer. And uh, Lord, I pray right now that you'd be with all of us as we continue the discussion and continue our connection together. We thank you and we praise you and it's in your son's name, amen.